Welcome to our podcast, Tis But a Scratch, Fact and Fiction About the Middle Ages. Today's episode, Medieval Movies, The Good, The Bad, and The Not-So-Bad. Hi, I'm Carol Fletcher, and I'll be joining Richard today. Hi, Carol. It's really good to talk to you again. I know we left off the last episode with me about to explain why I think there are so few historically accurate movies set in the Middle Ages. But before we get to that, I got curious about Monty Python's Killer Rabbit of Kira Banag and discovered on the website Medievalist.com that the rabbit story may actually have a medieval foundation. The early 13th century history of Merlin tells how a young King Arthur fought and was nearly killed, not by a rabbit, but by a killer house cat. So after a long and fierce struggle and a loss of a lot of blood, King Arthur finally managed to kill the cat. Afterwards, he confessed to Merlin, you can be sure that I've never feared for myself any more than I did when I was entangled with that devil. As Tim the Enchanter might have put it, that was the most foul, cruel, and bad-tempered feline that Arthur ever set eyes on. Now to get back to the subject of this episode, why there are so few historically accurate movies set in the Middle Ages. The main reason, I believe, is because in order to be commercially successful, a movie has to be able to appeal to a wide audience. And that means that the protagonist has to be someone with whom the audience can identify and imagine oneself in that situation and act in that way. The problem is that medieval sensibilities, medieval values, the worldview of medieval people, whether we're talking about the 7th century or the 15th century, was profoundly alien. And so the only way you could make a successful commercial film about the Middle Ages is if you put people into fancy dress, costume them up like they were in the Middle Ages, have really good sets with uh, everything looking like real castles or maybe even using real castles. But the people need to act like we would act in that situation. And that's true of movies like Braveheart, where Mel Gibson acts like that. Of course, the movie The Adventures of Robin Hood with Errol Flynn. It's true in spades of the movie that I'm going to uh, suggest as a prime example of bad medieval movies, The Kingdom of Heaven. There are so few movies that have medieval sensibilities. Well, that brings me to The Last Duel, which I just watched, the latest blockbuster. It doesn't seem to me that Jodie Comer as uh, Marguerite de, Ca- de Courage had medieval sensibilities. She seemed to come directly out of the Me Too movement. And I think she does come directly out of the Me Too movement. It's a, it's a really interesting movie. In my category of the good, the bad, and the not-so-bad medieval movies, this would be a not-so-bad medieval movie. What makes it a imperfect medieval movie is the third part of it, where you get Marguerite's own view of what happened. Because in that part of it, all of a sudden, you're not really having a medieval sensibility anymore. In the, in the way that it's presented with the way that uh, Jean de Car- Carouge tells his version of the story, and then the way that Jacques Legree tells his version of the story, both of those are, in fact, medieval. They both emphasize competitive honor, wealth, and status. The third one is of modern sensibility. It's a sensibility that makes the movie relevant Otherwise, the movie could appear to be alien, and it would be criticized as being this hyper-masculine movie that really doesn't appreciate how serious rape is. I doubted the authenticity of this movie from the start. After all, how can you make a movie with Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, and Adam Driver and cast Adam Driver as the most handsome man in the land? But seriously, um, there are some battle scenes, the first battle scene. And I was struck very much when I watched that scene that here they here they were all the everyone was in head to toe armor. There was some mail. There was some very serious armor. And they went into battle. And the minute they began fighting, the armor seemed to do no good at all. Blood was flying everywhere. People were dying. 
So what's the deal with that? Armor was protective. It really was. And if you really notice in the movie, the people who are dying are and getting slashed are the foot soldiers, the English foot soldiers who aren't armored. What they actually have on, it's either what's called a uh, cuir brûlé, which is boiled leather. And if you have boiled leather and three layers of it, it gives you some protective value. Or what they have is a jacket, which is made of layers of linen. Now, that can protect you somewhat, but it doesn't protect as well as having metal plate armor. And here what we have is pretty good costuming. They, they, get it, they get it pretty right for the period. This was a period in which full plate armor was first coming in. And full plate armor was very protected. But there would be places in it in which instead of having the plate, what you would have is mail. And that would be more vulnerable. The most vulnerable spot is the face. And in order to protect the face, what you would have is a visor. And mostly, if you could afford it, you'd have the helmet with a good visor. Now, the visor means that you have limited ability to uh, see. And it's probably very claustrophobic, but it's protected. Yeah, if movie. only they had advisor, their visors on in the last scene of the movie, they would have done a lot better, I think. They would have. But you would never have known who was who. <laughs> I mean, that's the problem. What you have to have is a movie where you can root or at least know who's winning. And you don't have visors in that battle scene in the beginning either. Yeah, 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 yeah. To what extent was it an accurate story? It was very accurate, the first two parts of it. Now, what isn't accurate about it is where the story and, in this case, the source material, the book by Professor Jager, where both of them go off is in the presentation of the climatic duel. The climatic duel is really exciting and draws from a description of the duel by the chronicler Foissat. Now, Foissat loved to portray chivalric action. He's a wonderful read, and he, and he was very popular. But Foissat wasn't anywhere near the event. He was not an eyewitness. He got this from hearsay. There were chroniclers, at least two of them who were present, and those two describe a very much different duel, a duel in which both dismounted before the, the fight began, in which there were no axes used at all, and in which you basically had two guys going at each other with, with uh, long swords. That was the duel, and it didn't seem to last as long or be nearly as dramatic. Now, what was agreed upon in all the sources about the duel is that Legree wounded Carouge by cutting into his thigh an exposed part that was protected only by the uh, chain mail. Now, that seems to be true. What's also true is that Legree sort of stood around admiring his work, <laughs> and Carouge recovered enough to charge at him, knock him down, and then kill him while he was on the ground. And the last part of it, where he demands that Legree confess to the rape, and Legree's response that he's innocent and he you know puts this before God in his soul, that also happened. And that was followed immediately with uh, John de Carouge plunging his knife into the neck of Jacques Legree, killing him. And what is also true is that after de Carouge killed Legree, the crowd went wild. The duel enhanced Carouge's honor and restored his finances. What is not historically accurate is how the film presents Marguerite's reactions to her husband's victory. Historically, Marguerite seems to have rejoiced in it, and she emerged from the combat as a celebrity in her own right. In the film, she opposes the combat. She is very much aware that if her husband is defeated, that she will be burnt at the stake. She begs Carouge not to fight, but Carouge is committed. And it's not in order to vindicate her honor. It's because of his honor. 
So we see the duel through her eyes. A duel which is not about the rape. A duel which is about her husband's hatred of his rival. A duel which is about the honor of these two men. Here the film has historical problems. For one thing, Marguerite wasn't present at the duel. For another, she probably did not face a death penalty. That only appears in Foissat, and it seems more likely that Foissat made it up. But what the end of the film emphasizes is that its theme is not about a cathartic combat between a hero and a villain. Rather, it's about the tragedy of a woman victimized by the toxic masculinity of the Middle Ages. But this was really a way that duels were used, discover the will of God? A trial by combat that places guilt or innocence in the hands of God, or a duel about honor, is very medieval. The Me Too movement, however, is not. But this was really a way that duels were used, discover the will of God? By the time this occurred, and this is 1387, and as the movie's title says, it's the last duel. Now, this was the last duel authorized by the Parlement of Paris. It wasn't the last authorized duel. The last royally authorized duel occurred in 1547. So we're talking about this practice continuing. Now, the thing about a judicial battle is that the judicial battles were more common earlier on than they were towards the end of the 14th century. And that's because of the growth of royal justice and royal courts. The only time that it was allowed to have a judicial battle, a trial by combat, was under certain circumstances. The circumstances had to be that the facts of the case were so unclear that a judgment could not be made oh, by, okay. a, by the judges on the basis of the evidence. The second thing was that it had to be a capital crime, something which rose to the level that would justify a trial by combat. And it had to be insisted upon by the participants. In this case, uh, Carouge wanted the trial by combat because he didn't think he was going to get a fair hearing, and he didn't get a fair hearing at the court of his own lord, Count of Alençon, Pierre, because um, Legree was one of Pierre's favorites, and he knew that. In the movie, Marguerite is at that trial. Neither Carouge nor his wife were at that trial. They were purposely absent. They had immediately appealed to the king in Paris. Carouge wow. wanted a trial by combat. But before he could get one, the case was then to was the Parlement, the royal council in Paris, and they heard all of the testimony. Now, in the movie, the accuser is Marguerite. Now, Marguerite is the one whose testimony is the accusation, but the legal accuser was not Marguerite. It was her husband, Carouge, which is why Legree responded to Marguerite's accusation by claiming that she was simply repeating a story that had been concocted by her husband because of his grievances against Legree, and that Carouge had threatened to beat his wife if she failed to corroborate this false accusation. Pierre's positive defense was logistic. He claimed that he was 25 miles away at the time of the rape, and that in the midst of winter, it would have been impossible for him to have ridden 25 miles, raped Marguerite, and then ridden 25 miles back. And he named several witnesses for his alibi, all of whom were supporters of the Count of Alençon, one of whom discredited himself completely by being arrested for a rape in Paris while the trial was in progress. Legree's defense in the movie his claim that this wasn't a rape, but it was consensual sex, that it was part of the game of love, that claim 
was never recorded in any of the sources and it seems to have been an invention for the sake of the movie. It was part of establishing the character of Legree as being the courtier in contrast to the character of Carouge, the soldier. Both of them examples of toxic masculinity, but in different ways. And Legree's own lawyer, who was probably the most distinguished lawyer in Paris at the time, a man by the name of Lacoste, his notes on the trial survive. And some of this is taken from those notes. Lecoq made a, as strong a case as he possibly could for Legree, but in his notes, he said to himself, he wrote this to himself, that he had real doubts about the innocence of his client. <laughs> well, slightly tangential, but let me ask you something. One of the paradoxes in the movie to me was that Legree seems to engage in all sorts of non-consensual sex, rape, um, and it's taken very casually and lightly. And yet this incident is taken very seriously as a capital crime. So I, I, I don't understand the difference. Is it because she was property of uh, Le Carrage? Is that the whole issue? Well, for one thing, rape is a crime of property. And it's a crime against both the woman and the property of the woman is her honor her reputation, and it's the an offense if she's married against her husband. So it is an offense against property. The reality is that rape probably was not uncommon. Um, Legree is not shown as raping women. He's shown as having fun sex, and I have no idea whether there really were orgies going on in the, co in the court of Alençon or not. Uh, you know, Pierre is presented as this rakish character, and Ben Affleck has a great time playing that role. But we have no idea, really, about the historical Pierre d'Alençon. All we know about him is that he had at least one illegitimate child, as well as numerous legitimate children. And um, there was a reputation that he had mistresses. That's what we know. This four in a bed, I'm not sure that that is historical, <laughs> as titillating as it might be. Um, but getting back to rape, the society in the 14th century, both in England and France, was a lot more violent than our society. It was more violent than the most, the most crime-infested city in either the United States or Europe. And the reason you had so much violent crime is because, one, alcohol was so prevalent. You couldn't drink the water. The water would give you, likely give you dysentery. So what you did was you drank something much safer. That was alcohol. In mm -hmm. England, lots of beer. In France, lots of wine. And that's what you would drink. Sociability meant taverns and people drank together. And they also were in a society which had a strong sense of honor. And that's not just among the nobility, that's among ordinary common commoners, this sense of honor, which means that insults are taken very seriously. And when you're drunk, it's easy to go from an argument to a homicide. It just <laughs> happens. You also have a society in which all the men, all the free men are walking around carrying knives. They're all armed. And this is another problem in terms of the violence. To compound that, all of that, what you have is no police force. So you have these crimes committed. Women were vulnerable. If a woman wasn't protected by a man, she was vulnerable. And women got raped. Legally, both in England and France, rape was a very, very serious crime. It was a heinous crime. What had in theory, what you had were really harsh penalties. The penalty could be castration, blinding, or hanging if you were convicted of rape. Now, the reality, this has been studied by historians like Hannah Skoda, and the reality was that although the legally 
the law books have rape as seriously punished. Few rapes were actually prosecuted. Mostly, women would not bring a charge. And it's for the reasons that you hear in the last part. It's that it's going to be adjudicated by men. Right. And that your the burden of proof was very, very high on the woman. What she would have to do is report the rape immediately. She would have to have some kind of corroborating evidence, preferably someone heard her scream. She had, would have something like ripped clothes. And uh, she had to tell her story in detail, both place and time. And she had to tell it repeatedly. And if one of the times she slipped and got the wrong day or the wrong place, her testimony was thrown out. The trial I, hate was say, I hate to say it, that sounds modern, but that's another issue. Yes. Um, we promised in this episode that we would do good movies, bad movies, and not so bad movies. So I guess you're saying that uh, The Last Duel is not so bad as a representation of the Middle Ages. I think uh, it's pretty good. How about uh, an example of a bad movie? A bad movie? I've already trashed um, Braveheart once. I don't think I have to trash it again. But for the reasons I said in the first episode, Braveheart is a... It's a good example of a bad and entertaining historical movie. The general audience will love Braveheart, and they did love Braveheart. Medieval historians will hate Braveheart. <laughs> now, among the other movies that fall into that category is The Kingdom of Heaven. and It's directed by Ridley Scott, the same man who directed Last Duel. Oh, that's interesting. This is about the Crusades. It's about the surrender of Jerusalem in 1187. And the movie is offensively a historical. I'll talk about that movie when I do an episode on the Crusades itself. But rest assured, virtually everything about that movie is wrong. Starting <laughs> with the hero, Balian, who historically, Balian of Iblin, was one of the great nobles of the kingdom of Jerusalem, who had grown up in the kingdom of Jerusalem, whose father was a baron of the kingdom of Jerusalem, who was one of the movers and shakers in politics. He was not a blacksmith who was the <laughs> bastard son of some knight who's coming to fetch him. I mean, that is ridiculous. But probably even more ridiculous than that is the end of the film. The end of the film, <laughs> Surrender of Jerusalem itself, where Balian comes out to confront Saladin, who is shown to be compassionate and reasonable. And Balian says to Saladin that if you don't permit us to surrender, what we will do is pull down all of your holy places, which has a source for it, and we'll pull down our holy places. What? You're going to pull down the Christian holy places? Come on, give me a break. The reason that <laughs> Balian says that is because Balian is a religious skeptic. He realizes all of this is nonsense, this crusading business. And like Saladin, he's a reasonable man. In other words, he's one of us. He's not one of them. <laughs> so I okay. I so a, 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 a dismal medieval movie to medi medievalists. Yeah. Um, are there any that are really good? Really yeah. accurate? Really accurate, really good, yes. And unfortunately, this is the type of movie that no one will ever see. This is Percival Le Galois. Oh, almost unwatchable, I have to say. It, it, it is pretty unwatchable, isn't it? Uh, it's a movie made by Eric Romer in the late 1970s. He had already made his reputation with movies like Claire's Knee, and he was one of the of the brilliant young uh, directors of the French New Wave movement of cinema, like Truffaut. It, you know, he was in that category, in that group. He got a high ratings on rot Rotten Tomatoes, very high. And it would get a high rating for medievalists. But as you said, the movie may be difficult to watch. And there's a reason for it. And it's the same reason why I say that this is an authentically medieval movie. And that's because in this movie is a literal translation 
not an adaptation, but a literal translation of a medieval poem, a medieval text to the big screen. The medieval poem is by Chrétien de Troyes, probably written close to 1191. The poem itself is unfinished. Chrétien was one of the great romance writers of the late 12th century. He was a Bruvert who was in the court of the Count of Flanders, and he wrote this for the Count of Flanders. What Romer did was he took the poem, and what he did is he translated the Old French into modern French verse. That is the script. And then what he did... why the, why the why the dialogue sounds so odd to modern... And it is odd to a modern ear. It's really, really faithful. It's so faithful that just as the medieval poem doesn't have any progression in terms of plot it's, and has no development of character, these individuals don't have an inner life. None of the characters have an inner life. They're just there and they are what you see. You, they don't have inner thoughts. Whatever they are thinking, they just simply say. That's medieval. Toward the middle of this, all of a sudden, the story of Percival is completely abandoned. And all of a sudden, we're following Gawain as he goes to a tournament. Why? Because that's what Kretzian did. <laughs> so it's a movie that is amazingly faithful to the medieval source. But it also is a movie which distances itself from the audience. And I think very, very purposely. The movie, right. the movie has what looks like a ridiculous, very cheap, um, backdrop. It, they're, they're all fake. You have fake looking castles. Very strange, very strange backdrop. Purposely. Metal trees, right? Purposely odd. Yeah. And the perspective is wrong. The castles are too small. For the people, what Romer did was his set design was based on late 14th, early 15th century manuscript illuminations, and it is completely artificial. Now, one of our favorite directors, and I know you hate him, Wes Anderson, does something very similar to this. It, it, it just like Wes Anderson, it distances you from the from any empathy for the plot or characters in the movie. And I think that's what Romer wanted. The lead character, Percival, is so alien to a modern audience that instead of being the naive, uneducated, but noble youth that Kretzian wanted to portray him as, the movie audience probably views him as a rude, callous dolt. Now, when Romer was questioned about this movie, what Romer said about it was he was making no effort to take his audience and set them down into the real Middle Ages. He wasn't interested in that. But what he wanted to do was he wanted to capture the ethos, the sensibility of the late 12th century, the mentalite, and he did it. This movie actually does. Including the kind of awe of nights that you see the... You yeah, see the New York Nights is what a true there who is writing this and singing it uh, to a court filled with young knights and uh, who is getting paid by a count or some of uh, some other baron. Yeah, knights are viewed with awe, and peasants are pretty much invisible. Right, right. Now I wanted to get into the uh, into the uh, evolution of the Holy Grail, and also into King Arthur. But I think we're out of time, so I think that should be another episode. Yeah, a gold chalice with a communion wafer in it. Maybe I'll have an episode about the Holy Grail itself. That could be fun. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much, Doctor Abrams. I appreciate it. And thank you for your questions, and especially for being willing to watch first of all Le Galois. I should mention also one other advantage of showing first of all Le Galois in the class. After I showed it and told the students that I thought it was a really good movie, they never asked me for another movie. <laughs>